Today we're going to read Of Plymouth Plantation by William Bradford. As we're reading, we need to consider the author's purpose. So Bradford may be informing the audience when he was trying to tell a new generation of pilgrims about their history and how they came to the United States. And he may be trying to persuade the audience when he's trying to inspire a new generation to continue the Puritan values that he brought with him to the United States. When we take a look at who was William Bradford as an author and explorer, as we read his exploration narrative, we can see that he was orphaned in the first years of his life and he was trained by relatives to be a farmer. He received little formal education and he was forced to educate himself. Although his exploration narrative of Plymouth Plantation was not published until 1856, more than 200 years after it was written, the book was known to the public and even quoted by the colonial historians long before it had been published. So here we're going to read today a first-hand account of his experience moving to the United States as an explorer. And we're going to think about what were his motivations for leaving England and what whole factors brought him to the United States. So let's take a look at the text that we see in our book. So William Bradford was alive between 1590 and 1657. He begins by describing survival in North America was a matter of endurance, intelligence, and courage. William Bradford had all three qualities. 13 years after the first permanent English settlement was established in Jamestown, Virginia, Bradford helped lead the pilgrims to what is now Massachusetts. Bradford, who had been born in Yorkshire, England, joined a group of Puritans who believed that the Church of England was corrupt. This group wished to separate from the church in the face of stiff persecution. They eventually fled to Holland and from there sailed to North America. In his work of Plymouth Plantation, Bradford provides an account of the experiences of these early settlers. Historians consider this account to be accurate. After the death of the colony's first leader, the Pilgrims elected Bradford governor. He was re-elected 30 times. During this tenure, he organized the repayment of debts to financial backers, encouraged new immigration, and established good relations with the North Americans, without whose help the colony never would have survived. He also instituted the town meeting within the colonies, a democratic process that continues to take place in state government today. Bradford was largely responsible for leading the infant colony through many hardships to success. In 1630, Bradford began to write of Plymouth Plantation, a first-hand account of the pilgrim struggle to endure, sustained only by courage and unending faith, unbending faith. The work written in the simple language known as Puritan plain style was not published until 1856. So background to his exploration narrative, in September of 1620, the tiny ship Mayflower set sail from Plymouth, England, bound for the Jamestown settlement in Virginia. The ship carried 102 pilgrims, many of them members of the separatist religious segregation. During the stormy Atlantic crossing, the ship was blown off course, which forced it to miss its intended destination. The boat finally set anchor near Cape Cod, Massachusetts in mid-November. So think about why did Bradford choose to leave? Maybe he was trying to find religious freedom as a Puritan and what he thought he was going to be able to find when he arrived in the United States. Okay, chapter nine from Of Plymouth Plantation, of their voyage and how they passed the sea and of their safe arrival at Cape Cod. September 6, 1620. After they had enjoyed fair winds and weather for a season, they were encountered many times with crosswinds and met with many fierce storms with which the ship was shrewdly shaken and her upper works made very leaky. And one of the main beams in the midships was bowed and cracked, was bowed and cracked, which put them in some fear that the ship could not be able to perform the voyage. So some of the chief of the company perceiving the mariners to fear the sufficiency of the ship as appeared by their mutterings, they entered into serious consultation with the master and other officers of the ship to consider in time of the danger and rather to return than to cast themselves into a desperate and inevitable peril. 
And truly there was great distraction and difference of opinion amongst the mariners themselves. Fain would they do what could be done for their wages' sake, being now half the seas over, and on the other hand they were loath to hazard their lives too desperately. But in examining of all opinions, the master and others affirmed they knew the ship to be strong and firm under water, and for the buckling of the main beam, there was a great iron screw and passengers brought out of Holland, which would raise the beam into his place, and which being done, the carpenter and master affirmed that with the post under it set firm in the lower deck and other ways bound, he would make it sufficient. And as for the ducks and upper works, they would caulk them as well as they could, and though with the working of the ship they would not long keep staunch, yet there would otherwise be no great danger if they did not overpress her with sails. So they committed themselves to the will of God and resolved to proceed. In sundry of these storms, the winds were so fierce and the seas so high as they could not bear a knot of sail, but were forced to hull for diverse day together. And in one of them, and they thus lay at hull, in a mighty storm, a lusty young man called John Howland, coming upon some occasion above the gratings, was with a steel of the ship thrown into the sea, but it pleased God that he caught hold of the topsail halyards, which hung overboard and ran out at length, yet he held his hold, though he was sundry, fathoms under water, till he was held by the same to the brim of the water, and then with the boat hook and other means got into the ship again, and his life saved, and though he was something ill with it, Yet he lived many years after and became a profitable member both in church and commonwealth. In all his voyage there died, but one of the passengers, which was William Button, a youth servant to Samuel Fuller, who they drew near the coast. But to, the, but to omit other things that I may be brief, after long beating at sea, they fell with that land, which was called Cape Cod, the which being made and certainly known for it, they were not a little joyful. After some deliberation and amongst themselves and with the master of the ship, they tacked about and resolved to stand for the southward, the wind and weather being fair, to find some place about Hudson's River for their habitation. But after they had sailed that course about half the day, they fell amongst dangerous shoals and roaring breakers, and they were so far entangled therewith as they conceived themselves in great danger. And the wind, wind shrieking upon them withal, they resolved to bear again for the cape, and thought themselves happy to get out of those dangers before night overtook them, as by God's providence they did. And the next day they got into the cape harbor, where they rid to safety. Being thus arrived in the good harbor and brought safe to land, they fell upon their knees and blessed the God of heaven, who had brought them over the vast and furious ocean and delivered them all the perils and miseries thereof, again to set their feet on the firm and stable earth, their proper element. But here I cannot but stay and make a pause and stand half amazed at the poor people's present condition. And so I think will the reader too, when he well considers the same being thus past the vast ocean and a sea of troubles before in their preparation as may be remembered by that which went before. They had now no friends to welcome them, nor inns to entertain or refresh their weather-beaten bodies, no houses for much less towns to repair to. To seek for succor, it is recorded in scripture as a mercy to the apostle and his shipwrecked company that the barbarian showed them no small kindness in refreshing them. But these savage barbarians, when they met with them, as after will appear, were readier to fill their sides full of arrows than otherwise. And for the season it was winter, and, that, and they that know the winters of that country know them to be sharp and violent, and subject to cruel and fierce storms, dangerous to travel to, unknown, to known places, much more to search an unknown coast. Besides, what could they see but a hideous and desolate wilderness? full of wild beasts and wild men. And what multitudes there might be of them they knew not. What could now sustain them but the Spirit of God and His grace? May not and ought not be the children of these fathers rightly say. Our fathers were Englishmen, which came over the great ocean 
and were ready to perish in that wilderness. But they cried unto the Lord, and he heard their voice, and looked on their ad adversity, etc. Let them therefore praise the Lord, because he is good, and his mercies endure forever. From Book 2, in 1620, in these hard and difficult beginnings, they found some discontents and murmurings arising amongst some, and mutinous speeches and carriages to others, but they were soon quelled and overcome by the wisdom, patience, and just the equal carriage of things by the governor, and better part, which cleaved faithfully together in the main. But that which was most sad and lamentable was that in two or three months' time half of our company died, especially in January and February being the depth of winter, and wanting houses and other comforts, being infected with the scurvy and other diseases which this long voyage and their inaccommodate condition had brought upon them. So as there died sometimes two or three a day in the foresaid time, that was that of one hundred and odd persons, scarcely fifty remained. And of these in the time of most distress, there was but six or seven sound persons who to their great commendations, be it spoken, spared no pains, night or day, but with an abundance of toil and hazard of their own health, fetched some wood, made them fires, dressed them meat, made their beds, washed their loathsome clothes, clothed and unclothed them. In a word, did all the homely and necessary offices for them which dainty and queasy stomachs cannot endure to hear named, and all this willingly and cheerfully, without any grudging in the least, showing herein their true love unto their friends and brethren. A rare example and worthy to be remembered, two of these seven were Mr. William Brewster, their reverend elder, and Miles Standish, their captain, the military commander, unto whom him, myself and many others were much beholden in our low and sick condition. And yet the Lord so upheld these pa persons, as in this general calamity they were not at all infected either with sickness or lameness. And what I have said of these I may say of many others who died in this general visitation, and others yet living, that whilst they had health, yea, or any strength continuing. They were not wanting to any that had need of them, and I doubt not but their recompense is with the Lord. But I may not here pass by other another remarkable passage not to be forgotten. As this calamity fell among the passengers that were to be left here to plant, and were haste ashore and made to drink water, that the seamen might have the more beer, and one in his sickness desiring but a small can of beer, it was answered that if he were their own father, he should have none. The disease began to fall amongst them also, so as almost half of their company died before they went away, and many of their officers and lustiest men, as the boats boys, boat swain gunner, three quartermasters, the cook, and others, at which the master was something stricken and sent to the sick shore, and told the governor he should send for beer for them that had need of it, though he drunk water homeward bound. But now amongst his company there were far another kind of carriage, and this misery that amongst the passengers, for they had not been boon, companions in drinking and jollity, and the time of their health and welfare, began now to desert one another in this calamity, saying they would not hazard their lives for them, and they should be infected by coming to help them in their cabins, and so after they came to die by it, would do little or nothing for them, but if they died, let them die. But such of the passengers as were yet aboard showed them their mercy, what mercy they could, which made some of their hearts relent, as the boatswain and some others who had proud, were proud young men and would often curse and scoff at the passengers. But when he grew weak, they had compassion on him and helped him. When he confessed he did not deserve it at their hands, he was abused by, he had abused them in word and deed. Of saith he, he you I now see, show you love like Christians indeed one to another, but we let one another lie and die like dogs. All this while the Indians came skulking about them, and would sometimes show themselves aloof. Of but what and when any approached near them, they would run away, and once they stole away their tools, where they had been at work, and were gone to dinner. But about the 16th of March, a certain Indian came boldly amongst them, 
and spoke to them in broken English, which they could well understand, but marveled at it. At length they understood by discourse with him that he was not of these parts, but belonged to the eastern parts where some English ships came to fish, with whom he was acquainted and could name sundry of them by their names, amongst whom he had got his language. He became profitable to them in acquainting them with many things concerning the state of the country and the east parts where he lived, which was afterwards profitable unto them. As also the people hear of their names, number, and strength of their, of their situation and distance from this place, and who was chief amongst them. His name was Samoset. He told them also of another Indian whose name was Squanto, a native of this place, who had been in England and could speak better English than himself, being after some time of entertainment and gifts dismissed, and while after he came again, and five more with him, they brought again all the tools that were stolen away before, and made way for the coming of their great scheme, of their great sachem, called Massolt, who, who about four or five days after came with the chief of his friends and other attendants with the aforesaid Squanto, with whom after friendly entertainment and some gifts given them, they made a peace with him, which hath new continu now continued this twenty-four years in these terms. One, that neither he nor any of his should injure or do hurt to any of their people. Two, that if any of his did any hurt to any of theirs, he should send the offender that they might punish him. Three, that if anything were taken away from any of theirs, he should ca cause it to be restored, and they should do the like to his. Four, if any did unjustly war against him, they would aid him if any war if any war against them he should aid them five he should send to his neighbors confederates to certify of them of this that they might not wrong them but might be likewise comprised in the conditions of peace and six that when their men came to them they should leave their bows and arrows behind them after these things he returned to his place called so so Wums some forty miles from the, this place, but Squanto continued with them and was their interpreter and was a spe special instrument sent by God for their good beyond their expectation. He directed them how to set their corn, where to take fish, and to procure other commodities, and was also their pilot to bring them to unknown places for their profit, and never left them till he died. He was a native of this place and scarce any left alive besides himself. He was carried away with diverse others by one hunt, a master of the ship, who thought to sell them for slaves in Spain. But he got away for England and was entertained by a merchant in London, and employed in Newfoundland and other parts, and lastly brought hither into these parts. 1621. They began now to gather in the small harvest they had, and to fit up in their houses and dwellings against winter, being well, all well recovered in health and strength, and had all things in good plenty. For as some were thus employed in affairs abroad, others were exercised in fishing about cod and bass and other fish, of which they took good store, of which every family had their portion. All the summer there was no want, and now began to come to in store of fowl, as winter approached of which this place did abound when they came first, but afterward decreased by degrees. And besides waterfowl, there was great store of wild turkeys, of which they took many besides venison. Besides, they had about a peck of meal a week to a person, or now since harvest Indian corn to that proportion, which made many afterwards write so largely of their plenty here to their friends in England, which were not feigned, but true sports. So after you've read the story, consider what were William Bradford's motivations for leaving England? What did he hope to gain when he arrived in the United States? What challenges did he face as he was traveling? And how did he, were the, Indian, the Native Americans greet him? And what relationship did the explorers form with the Native Americans that they met in the United States?